Here we go, here we go, a little intro sound, which we're probably going to change in the near future, but this is what we have for now. And our guest today is one and only Stephen Coleman. Nice I to meet you. I said it right. <laughs> nice to meet you. How are you, buddy? I'm good, buddy. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm so glad that you're here today. My pleasure. So you drove all the way from where? Uh, Kettering in Northamptonshire. So it's about a two hour drive down the M40. This is how much I matter to Stephen. He drove two hours just for me. <laughs> now, actually, he has a rehearsal at seven o'clock close Heathrow. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so but I, I would have I would have made the journey for you anyway. Stop it. <laughs> um, so me and Stephen, we go not that far back. Actually, we, it's been a reason when we actually met in person and we worked in uh, a music video for KSI. Uh, which was very cool because it was only two days and there was so much action. It was it was yeah, pretty it was cool. Pretty hectic, yeah. But before that, we did uh, know of each other. I think I started following your uh, wushu day wushu stuff, and I, s- I saw you on Instagram. I don't know why would you follow me back, whatever the thing was. Because <laughs> I'm a nice guy and you're so handsome, obviously. Oh, stop it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so Steven is here today, and we're just gonna have a talk about pretty much. You know, all, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff. Um, first, as I do with all my guests, I would like to just have a little bit of info from your kind of upbringings, where you're from and so where you grew up and if you can start from yeah, there. Yeah, certainly, yeah. So um, I was born and raised in Kettering in Northamptonshire, which is obviously where I live now. Um, and I came from a like a normal council estate background, um, normal school, all, all of that kind of thing. Um, very much into sports, football, basketball, that sort of thing. Started karate at the age of eight. Um, I got into that after watching martial arts movies with uh, my best friend, Sean, at the time, and my older brother, Andrew. So um, I got into, uh, yep, there we go. And that's my uh, <laughs> my first karate competition, um, which was kind of cool. I didn't even know that anybody had filmed that. I only found that footage um, last year. Oh, that's which, pretty cool. Which is pretty cool. And this is what you do. You were doing kata. That was your kata performance and first competition, right? That's correct, yeah. So um, we all trained in kata and kumite, um, but my sensei at the time was like, no, no, um, you're a pretty boy. You're good at dancing. You go and do kata. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I ended up learning, um, I think it's a, a brown belt kata, uh, Basai Dai, as you can see there, um, which was great for these sort of competitions. Um, I won the Junior National Karate Championships back then as well, um, but um, some of the judges were a bit not happy with me doing such a high level kata. This kid not, doesn't look anything like you. I know, he's, he's so much more good looking. I'm just, <laughs> I know, you know what happened. <laughs> he's, he's, he's talented, I've got nothing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this was the first competition I did. I won that one, and that sort of set precedence for the future then. I love the outfits for the guys who are sitting in the back. <laughs> that, if I remember rightly, that was actually the um, the area club tracksuit. Oh, um, right. And if you win this competition, um, you actually became a member of that squad, mm. and you got given that tracksuit. I mean, bearing in mind, this was early 90s. And you tried your best not to win it, because you did not they were won, horrible, Yeah, <laughs> horrible shell suit tra- tracksuits, yeah, as they all were in the 90s. Oh my god, those things, and they're wearing jeans, and look at them being so cool there sitting. Yeah. That's cool. Well, here you go, this is one of the things what we have in common. I did Shotokan as well, uh, but I started way later. I think I started age of 12 till age of 16, mm. and yeah, in about two years, I started, uh, well, I did fighting. I wasn't pretty, um, and my movements were not that <laughs> awesome. Um, but it was fun. It was fun. I mean, uh, yeah, and a lot of people uh, did Shotokan, and there was some, do you know any specific reasons why Shotokan karate was so popular at those days? Um, I think it was um, probably to do with uh, Chuck Norris. If I'm not mistaken, mm. I think Chuck Norris um, started out or actually did Shotokan, I mean, whether he diversified later on or, or not, I'm not sure. But um, it seemed to be um, the most straightforward type of karate that was in England during the 70s mm. and the 80s. Um, you couldn't find any other type of karate during sort of like the 80s anyway. Um, although now there are obviously quite a few different styles. Mm. I think it was just heavily influenced by the movies because you know what the martial arts movies were like in the 80s. 
Um, and that's really, you know, the only thing that was available karate-wise back then. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. We had the same thing. I think in Latvia, uh, we had uh, Shotokan, and there was the other one where, uh, which was way crazier. What was that style? There was um, Wadaru, Wadaru, uh, Gojuru, um, and then um, there is another one. Yeah, uh, there's a, the third one where they kick in the stomach and and then kick in the head, but yeah, don't punch in the, in the head. That's right. I can't remember what the name. Is. No doubt, somebody who's listening will be sitting there. Going, yeah, yeah, it's this. It's, it's this. this. You one. can't call yourself karate, guys, if you don't Assholes. even know what it is. <laughs> So um, I apologize for not knowing that. That's fine. We're going to figure out that later. Um, okay. You grew up with brothers, sisters. Yes. Yeah. So um, I have a, a younger brother mm -hmm. um, who's now a um, senior portfolio manager for Paddy Power Betfair, I believe. <laughs> yeah. <it's> like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all the performers, when they hear oh, that shit. No, yeah. I'm the CEO of this and this. So what do you do all day? I sit on my ass. Well, Thanks. he does take a lot of meetings. That's for sure. There you go. Um, and then I have a, an older sister and older brother. Um, we have same mum, different dad. Mm. Um, so Andrew was born in Hong. Uh, was probably born in. He was born in Leeds, but he grew up in Hong Kong in the seventies. Oh, wow. um, and then uh, when my mum moved back to England, he moved with her as well. And my sister was born in uh, the late seventies. So they're half Chinese. Um, so I get my first early martial arts influence from my big brother because oh. he was doing he was doing kung fu as a kid before I was even born. Um, and obviously, being the eighties, and my older brother who was born in nineteen seventy two. Um, he loved martial arts movies, absolutely loved them. So my m exposure during the 80s, during my growing up, was all martial arts movies. Uh, and, Can and you re rewind me some very, from the very beginning? So your dad, yeah, um, he got married with a uh, Chinese lady? No, no, with an Eng English lady. Right. Um, but my mum had, uh, had a husband before my dad. Who was a Chinese guy? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, you had a older half brothers and half brother and half sister. half sister. That's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Ellie, my older sister, she's a doctor, mm -hmm. um, and Andrew lives in Norfolk. And I actually don't know what he does at the moment. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Andrew. Um, but for sure, he's... get in touch with your brother and tell what you do. Yeah, that's right. I'll text him now, and he'll be like, um, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> I'm actually successful. <laughs> So, My um, parents are actually proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's why we don't talk to each other. So, um, yeah, he's, uh, Andrew was really the biggest influence um, in my early years um, in martial arts with movies, with kung fu, with everything, even right into my teens as well because mm. he was still training quite hard then as well. Oh, okay. And yeah. then he stopped when he was... Um, I think life took over. You know how it does with most people. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's no direct reason for you to be training martial arts, uh, whether it's for movies or self-defense mm. or because you're heavily into a system that you want to, you know, black belt, 10th dan, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then life generally starts to take over, doesn't it? You know, you, you meet a partner, you get a house, some people have kids, etc., etc. Yeah. So, so this is a perfect way to now tell me why did you continue in martial arts? How come you are? Because um, I'm really boring, have no life. Because no. <laughs> you're you're um, almost forty. No, I'm forty this year. I'm forty next month. Actually, yeah, yeah. first in, for, forty next month, yeah. and you're still you are doing amazing stuff. Like honestly, see someone in forties doing, you know, um, wushu in that level. Uh, it's insane. So obviously, we're going to show a video of you doing some of that stuff. A bit of uh, the video is the title of the video is the lamest ever. A bit of wushu. <laughs> a bit really? of wushu. <laughs> so I'm guessing this this was for commercial for um, those um, the the stretch stretchy suit. stretchy suits. Yeah, I, I think I saw so many guys doing the, the same commercial, and obviously I'm jealous because I was never asked to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the stretch suits are fantastic. They so, uh, they they're really good for stunt men and, and actors and uh, athletes. Just in well. general, in the movement, try to pick up a key or something on the floor if you have mm. jack legs like mine. Yeah, you know, and then you just rip your trousers. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I I wear my stretch suit um, for casual events. Yeah, um, not just for doing stunts. Yeah, yeah it's just comfy because they're comfy and lightweight, and yeah, they're just they're really good. Yeah, um, so double swords. How many? Just quickly, how many different uh, weapons do you do in Wushu? Um, Wushu has like literally dozens and dozens. Yeah, the ones, that I've, the ones I've trained are straight sword, broadsword, which is one of those, double broadsword, um, staff, spear, um, pudao, which is like a long wooden handle with a sword on the end of it. 
Mm. Um, what else have I done? Southern Broadsword, Southern Staff, Tai Chi Sword. Um, Is I've it the same sword, just slower? It, yeah, <laughs> essentially, yeah. <laughs> um, Slow-mo sword. S- same thing, just slow. Um, whip so that's chain just and rope dart. That's just a single sword? That's just a single broadsword, yeah. Single broadsword. That's a southern broadsword. That's massive. Anyone who is listening this, they have to see it. There's some sexy moves. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What is it going to be? So this is part of a, one of my competition sword routines. So this is actually my uh, Great Britain team training session. Wow, you were spinning like a single arrow there. Casual jeans. Just casual. Yeah. And naturally, you've got to do lightsaber stuff. If you do weapons in Wushu, you've got to pick up a lightsaber at some point and start yeah, yeah, flinging yeah. it around. Yeah, well, so I've done Kung Fu for two years, uh, and I did uh, one competition, and I win. I won in both of my disciplines. I did uh, a one form. I already forgot the name of it. And I did uh, bow stuff, so traditional Kung Fu, uh, Kung Fu bow stuff. Uh, but it's a lot of fun, so much fun. Anyone who wants to, you know, learn some weapons, I think traditional Kung Fu or Wushu, what would you say for people who never done any any of that and they're like, oh, I would like to learn some? Traditional Kung Fu is more widely available in England. Okay. Um, and there are crossover similarities between the two. But generally, traditional Kung Fu, you're going to learn a, a traditional martial art and martial application. Mm. Whereas Wushu is actually a sport evolved from martial arts. So you never learn a martial application in a proper wushu class. Mm-hmm. You will learn it specifically for performance and competition. So if you can get wushu, the physical requirement is much, much harder than a traditional uh, kung fu class. Oh, um, kung fu guys probably going to disagree, but... Well, the, <laughs> to be honest, the level of flexibility and strength yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and dexterity that you need to do wushu to a high level... Um, because it's a sport, because it's an international sport, it's an Olympic recognised sport, is that much greater. Is it Olympics? Is it a part it, of the Olympics It's already? an Olympic recognised sport, um, and the International Federation have been trying for years oh, to get to it get into it the Olympics. Out. It is in the Youth Olympics in 2024, I believe, um, which is a good start. Yeah. You know, um, but it's one of those ones that need to be voted in every time, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is very, very difficult. And do, do you have any... Um comments regarding what's going on in uh, uh olympics now in japan japan right it is in japan yeah in so and um the deal with karate so they just decide oh we're gonna have karate in our olympics how can this country decide like well, well the thing is with um you have your mainstream sports which are in the olympics every single time things like gymnastics um uh, swimming all the usual and then you have a handful of sports that get voted in. So a lot of sports around the world are Olympic recognized sports like Wushu. Mm. And every country then has a, um, a voting list. So they say, right, of these 20 other sports, we need to vote in oh. X amount of sports. That's why every Olympics you'll, you'll see something new. Like now we've yeah, got see, karate, I never paid attention so much. I don't even know. Um, they're talking about putting breakdancing in the next Olympics. That would be sick. Um, I would be all pro that. So and and wushu again is one of those that has to be voted in to get in. It's like just just compare how much more interesting is to watch a break dancing versus throwing javelin. <laughs> like honestly, I mean guys, I have nothing against javelin, but if I would need to choose between a super duper break dancer who's just making these cool moves with a sick music, you know, or someone who's just like throwing something across the <laughs> across the stadium. Come on. Um yeah, so that means that Wushu could be in a future in Olympics. Because uh, Taekwondo has been Olympics now how long? I don't even know, but a very long time. It's been I'm very sure long it's time. more than, been more oh, than okay. 20 years, probably 30 years. I'm really? Not, yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Oh, that's quite long. Um, but Taekwondo, in a similar effect to Wushu, has um, changed a lot over the duration as well. Um, it's... You, you've got international taekwondo and world taekwondo, two different yeah, federations. Yeah, there's a name for the... What were yeah, the ab- ITF abbreviation? and WTF. Yeah. Um, and I think... I mean, I don't know exactly with taekwondo because I'm not clued up on it, but I know that one focuses on Olympic um, taekwondo competition stuff mm. and one is the traditional martial art. So although they have similarities, there are also a lot of differences. Mm. And something similar has happened with Wushu in the last 20 years as well. Um, what we call old school wushu, which is what Jet Li did, which uh, which is what Donnie Yen did and Ray Park, 
Um, they are old school Wuzhou guys. That's actually where I started, where my coach started as well. It's changed a lot. Since 2005, it's taken this direction mm. that really wants it to get into the Olympics. So the sport is now all about the jumpy, jumpy stuff yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and less about the martial arts style of Wuzhou. Mm. Um, so it is very different now from what it used to be 20 years ago. And that's because of the Olympic drive. I like the names you mentioned, the Wuzhou people. So there was Donnie Yen, yep. then was uh, Ray Park, who yep. I actually doubled once. Oh, did you? Yeah, I doubled him on uh, Scott Atkins' film. Oh, Accident Man. Yeah, Accident yeah. Man, exactly. And really cool dude. Yes. Like, very, very, and it's like, I didn't do much. Um, there was this one nasty fall, which probably no one in their right mind should be doing. And they're like, oh, doubles come in. <laughs> and I did it. And it was funny because I landed it. And even uh, Michael J. White came over and he's like, dude, this is like insane. Like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And no one filmed on their phones because oh, they were no. also, they, they were just like glued to monitors to see what's going on. Mm. So no one had that on their phones and then it didn't make the cut. Oh, I yeah. never got that footage of me being smashed against the floor. But you still retain the broken ribs and <laughs> the, 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 the split spine and everything, yeah. Yeah, I pretty much uh, just have that in my head, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Ray's a, Ray's a really cool guy. He's um, big wushu guy in the 90s european champion national champion um and everything that you see him do in star wars and all the other stuff is all of its foundations are wushu so for them, someone who doesn't know who is ray park uh just think about star wars there's a darth maul character with the uh, horns and red face and has amazing uh fight choreography so yeah and that's the one who I think the the most popular that fight is because of the uh, butterfly twist. Yeah, like one of the coolest moves he was doing there, and probably, obviously using probably the stuff. outside of um, Hong Kong cinema, I would dare to say the best butterfly twist ever put on a Hollywood movie. Mm. I would definitely say so because yeah. Ray could really jump. Yeah, um, yeah, and to jump in all of that outfit was really quite something i can imagine so and, and he probably had to do it like 100 times yeah for you that know what fight. It's, yeah you know what it's like on set it's yeah never and just the one yeah and <laughs> butterfly uh, uh, twist is as as soon as you get a little bit more tired and you know even better than that i learned butterfly twist only like five years ago and uh so to get it like a perfect in that kind of a level it, it's tough as soon as you get tired your legs go down and you're just like it's not yeah not that you good. might as well just do a, st a standing jumping twist yeah <laughs> but it looks insane so let's um still check out your what do you have here so that's again sword just mixing between videos Oh, look, talk about this. And twist. butterfly to it. Oh my god, it's a slow motion. So good. Douche. I love the music. It was one of my favorite songs. That so tra soundtrack was in uh, uh, Jackie Chan uh, with the black actor. Uh, what was the name? Rush uh, Hour. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were singing, What it is a good brilliant, for Brilliant record. Ah. Ooh. <laughs> Loved it. Hey. She just came back from that disco parties when they just dress all white. That's it, yeah. <laughs> Warmed up and everything. Yeah. I'm just kind of going between different videos. Yeah, you see, this is one of the things where, like, when someone does the spin kick this way, I can say a certain way, that's whether Kung Fu or Wushu. Because <laughs> if that would be a, a uh, kickboxer, they would chamber and then they whip. Correct. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's it's something. I don't know how to say that. Like it just feels it's beautiful. You know, there's no no doubt about it. But I think like effective wise, you know, waste of time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. a it's a performance kick. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Wushu, um, majoritively are straight leg kicks, leg swings. Mm. Um, so normally you'll see that sort of thing in a wushu routine. And most people that do wushu when they do fight choreography, if they're doing it themselves, will actually have straight leg kicks like this. Mm. Um, but you're absolutely right. It, there is no practical application for this whatsoever. And visually, it does look better because like, if you do the whip, it's too fast. It can't register. And especially yeah. also for cameras as well. Yeah. But yeah, when you chamber, then you can turn around. And actually, if you're a good kicker, you can decide whether you even do still do the whip kick or you spin whip kick or you just do push kick or whatever. Yeah. I like how we're dissecting your uh, performance. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. <laughs> there you go. That's one of the probably also that that move is one where the aerial, uh, yep. which is one of the 
Very signature moves in Wushu. Hey, nice landing. So that kick again, straight leg kicks. Yeah, and here you go. And this one, you can see like it's not, not as straight. Like legs are lower. That's mm. what I was talking about. And but it's still very high. That's to um, facilitate the extra half twist to land facing the camera. Oh. Yeah. So you have excuse for it. I do every time. <laughs> <laughs> to facilitate to a the camera like that. <laughs> Oh, sick, dude. This is awesome. Awesome stuff. Hey, the same <laughs> butterfly kick. Oh, no, that's just a butterfly. Nice. That is butterfly kick. That is but butterfly The previous kick, yeah. was butterfly uh, twist. Um, yeah, and then now, almost 40 years old. Uh, what was the last time you were performing? Are you still performing actively yep. in Mushu? Yep. Right. Um, so... My last competition was the end of 2019. Sorry, I meant competition, not performing. Oh, sorry, competition. performing you can perform any, same thing. anywhere. Performance yeah. competition is the same. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I mean, in terms of being able to perform, yeah, it's the same as. Well, if you go and perform in like a senior house, you know, okay. I, I don't, I don't yeah, think yeah, they're that, gonna go like, oh my god, that butterfly twist wasn't high enough. Technically, you was <laughs> actually off there, so yeah, we don't like it. <laughs> Just yeah. do like little <laughs> notes. Seven point zero. <laughs> yes. Sorry, yes. If you come later terrible. to my room, then it's gonna be ten points. <laughs> Exactly. Such a lovely guy. <laughs> um, competition, yeah. Last one was I did the World Championships in 2019 and then um, the Swiss Open Championships in November 2019. Then obviously COVID happened in around mm. March, April the following year. And it's just been off and on training since then. So there's been no competitions that we can go to. Um, and we haven't even been competition prepared um, in that time. So... What are we looking at now? 2021. So we might try and get to another competition maybe next April. Mm -hmm. um, get back to some of the um, European competitions. Um, but my goal now is to hit the World Championships in 2023. We were supposed to be going to Texas in, in November this year for the World Championships, but that's been cancelled. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm now looking 2023 World Championships, um, which I'm hoping is going to be in Texas because my first ever World Championships was in, Texas was in Texas in 2002. So for me, it's kind of like a, a milestone. That is That would be pretty cool. But And you're going to be 42 years old. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. If you just, if you look at my age and cross your eyes, it's 24 years old. So, <laughs> you know, it's cool. <laughs> I thought you're going to go with the age is just a number. <laughs> no, that's, a, I used to say that all the time. Yeah, and people were like, yeah, yeah, like, shut, shut up. up. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Stop it. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, where's it? No. Hey, that's the one. Jesus Christ. We literally repeated like three times the same shit. <laughs> um, wow. It's like we're finishing each other's sentences, Stephen. I know. And we know each other not that long. We have something going on there. That's what it is, yeah. Um, talking about Bushu, and also like I was wondering the question regarding the age and, and like w what are the oldest performers you've ever seen like performing still in you Bushu? You're looking at him. You are the oldest one, like what, in UK or in the world? In the world. Are you serious? Most people in Wushu will retire from mainstream competition, usually in their late 20s. Some go into their early 30s. Wow. And then you have the very rare few mm -hmm. um, that will venture into their mid 30s. Um, physically, most people have to retire by their 40s mm -hmm. because they just cannot keep the training up. Um, your metabolism slows down, your recovery slows down, your fast twitch ability starts to dissipate as you get towards your 40s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you turn, um, you, you're getting you, older, you're getting obviously. Older. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But what is the, what kind of categories that, that, does that become? Is there some kind of a senior or something? Well, I mean, in in modern wushu, in, the, in, in what I do, there is no veterans category. It's mm. basically 18, it used to be 18 to 35. And then they scrap the 35 and it's just 18 and above. So you're competing against 18. anyone between 18 and, and your upwards. age? Yeah. So I was um, I was the oldest at the last World Championships. Um, I was the second eldest, I think, in the 2015 World Championships. And I will definitely be the oldest at the next World Championships. So just for me to get there and compete that is and do a routine yeah. in itself is, is an achievement. But for me, that's not enough. Obviously, I want to go there and, and do the best routine I've ever done, yeah. which is asking a lot. But yeah, yeah. I know myself, I know my training, 
Um, I've been with my coach for 20 years. He knows m my training. Who's your coach? Uh, his name is Mike Donahue. So he was uh, an, a Wushu athlete on the Great Britain team in the 90s. Ray mm -hmm. Park's teammate. Mm. Um, then Mike um, took some time off Wushu to start his own business. Um, and he worked in the United States for a while. And when he came back, he started coaching Wushu. And it was just a matter of time then um, before he sort of handpicked his um, students who were going to become the next crop of athletes. Uh, just be honest, tell what happened. You did fencing for his house. <laughs> Do you know what? He's the only one I haven't done it for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what Steven does is his day. What do you call it? A day job? Day, like that's yeah, your day business. Job. Yeah, so when I'm, when I'm not doing, um, when I'm not working on a movie or a TV show or something like that, uh, my day job is I have a small construction business. And that explains the tan. That explains it? the farmer's tan. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Like everybody's like, you've been on holiday. I'm like, well, if I showed you the rest of my body, you wouldn't think yeah. so because oh I'm my pale. God. <laughs> and that's uh, that's your dad's business. He it, started it. That's correct. Yeah. So my dad started the uh, the business back in the 90s. Mm. Um, and I left school when I was 17 and moved to London to train full time. I was in London for about five years. Uh, but... I mean, I essentially ran out of money, basically. Mm. I ran out of money. So I had to come back home to Kettering. Um, my dad gave me a job. Um, and I uh, basically learned the business from the ground upwards. So working on the tools, um, learned everything about the job from a business perspective. Um, and then in late 2005, I took, took over the business um, and have been doing it ever since. And it's a very, very good um, backup. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, I mean, a, a lot of people I know, and you probably know as well, who I'm own, one of them. <laughs> who, when you when you have to rely on um, performance work yeah. for your income, it's very very difficult. It's very difficult. It's very and difficult yeah. Having seen that a lot, I was like, okay, I, I need to make sure I build up a um, a business first, mm. so that I can also pick and choose the jobs that I do, the film and TV jobs, but also I haven't got to rely on it for my living. Yeah. Um, and it always uh, one of the biggest ones goes down to your health. So if you got any injuries and you are, you know, training for all these competitions and stuff, for you to get an injury, you know, you you, ne you never know. It just could it. be a normal training day for you, and you can twist your ankle. You can something can happen, and then uh, if you get hired for a job, and they're like, oh, what we want you to run and jump, and he's like, I can't. So what are you going to do for a living? So that's definitely, I think, most of the stunt performers who are in the stunt industry or any any performers dancing uh, circus. Uh, most of them, they have B plans. Yeah, so. yeah. It's it's really really good and very wise to have a backup plan. Um, yeah, most of them they have what they, what is that called? Uh, Insurance. No, 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 no. no. The, the, when they have those uh, wealthy parents. Yeah, you yeah. Wish. If only. Uh, oh, only fans. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, okay. hear your, I hear your only fan site is quite. I, big, I was considering. I was. Sta I started considering. Maybe I can just turn my, my podcast and only fans as well. That's one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's our first segment. Uh, go to the end. And we will be back in second. Little dance after every... You need to do a dance. And we are back. <laughs> I like that. better, right? That works really well. Do the choreography again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Renars and Steven talking about things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, with this whole equipment, I feel like a little radio thing. I always want to do a radio. You should. And now do I can your own radio show. I don't need to do radio. I can do podcasts. This is way more fun. Way more fun. No one you, tells you get me to edit the rubbish stuff out. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's, it's a lot of it. That's why I film five hours so I can have like one hour now. Now, actually, so far, honestly, this is going to be this is number twenty, by the way. Number twenty. Congratulations. Yeah, this is number twenty. I released fifteen so far. And none of them being edited. It's just put anything what I have. It's just there because that's the whole idea of the podcast. Mm. You just go raw and just you know this is it is what it is. You get the best bits when you go raw. Yeah, exactly. Oh <laughs> hey. my god, where are you going? No. There? Oh, no. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Okay. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how it's been changing uh, for Wushu in the last like, probably 20 years? How do you think the future looks like? Because in Latvia, uh, actually one of my best friends was at the time, I think I even mentioned his name to you, uh, Dianis Vishkidis. He was like pretty high level. He even went to Russia. He got a really good, um, good results in Russian competition. 
and uh, and one of my other mates, and they they were. But I remember then when I went for Canada 13 years ago, he went with me, and mm. then he said that Wushu was like kind of dying out almost. And yeah. it's like, how does it? How is it in the UK? Yeah, it's exactly the same. The um, the popularity of Wushu in England has literally fallen apart in the last 15 to 20 years, um, and that really is a direct result of how the sport has changed. Um, and the, the International Wushu Federation determine basically the direction of Wushu. Um, because of the Olympic drive, they've tried to make the sport more appealing to the, Olymp to the Olympics. So right. the, the rules and the regulations have all changed. And obviously how you perform Wushu on the carpet for competition is designed around the rules and regulations. Um, it's very, very complicated now. Um, and it's very difficult for just normal people to understand. To be fair, even a lot of athletes and coaches still don't fully understand the up-to-date rules and regulations. Mm. And as a result, it just really puts people off. Um, whereas sort of 80s and 90s style wushu, it's much, much easier to understand. You can see, you can see the difference between something that's good and something that's not good. And it's fun to do. More importantly, it's fun for kids to do. Mm. Whereas now it's very, very boring for kids to do. Really? Simply because, you know, the, the emphasis on competition wushu requires um, very, very boring training. There's no, it's not like karate or taekwondo or anything like that where you've got grades or colored belts um, or stages of development. Yeah, there's no... Because no, when you have belts, like um, even... Even now in BJJ when I'm training, um, so I have my white belt, I just started. And then you look forward because you have, for each belt, you have like four grades. Mm. Oh, and, and then you also can evaluate who, who is going to be uh, uh, rolling with you. So, oh, they they have blue belt, second grade. So it's like, what's their level? And they kind of also looking after it, uh, forward to it. And when they get belts, it just feels like such an achievement. And, mm. you know, it's uh, a lot of people finish after they got the blue belt because they're like, oh, that's I'm done. Uh, but yeah, so wushu and kung fu doesn't have that uh, either. Um, some some traditional some of them. kung fu styles do. Um, they, that's so why some samba uh, was it not samba? No, um, where the they actually fight as well. San sanda. 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 So sanda comes under the under the umbrella of wushu. Mm -hmm. It's like the, it is the fighting competition yeah. side of wushu. Um, individual clubs may have uh, gradings and belts and all that kind of stuff, but actual wushu for competition. Um, has no gradings um, mm. at club level or national level, certainly not in England. Um, maybe some clubs in and around Europe might have that. But the the real issue is because Wushu is a sport and not a martial art, um, it's trained as a sport. You train in the gym, you train physical um, exercises, and then you train your, your basics, you know, like stances and all of that kind of stuff. And it's a very, very difficult and boring process for kids, especially, hmm. because um, there is no early achievements. There are no, There's nothing to look forward to. Or like a visible achievements. Like, exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. And it could be quite tedious just doing stance work and basics, session in, session out. So, hmm. uh, And that's the same throughout Europe as well. So the, the popularity of Wushu in the last 15 years, the last 20, 15 years, is really, really sort of, decreasing so yeah. much so much and it's a shame because it's killing the sport yeah and it's a beautiful sport as well it i mean really like is, now yeah. probably because of the uh, uh, mma and ufc um you know because of that is so popular now everyone wants to grapple mm. everyone wants to do mma and it's interesting like i noticed people want to do mma a couple years ago and then they just go training get beaten up they're like no no, no, no i don't no, want to no. do this <laughs> and then then grappling comes in oh yeah. i can do that i don't get beaten up like one of the clubs i'm into uh, like this morning i actually had my session and you can see some of those guys like there just because to attend you know it's like they don't even want to go even break a sweat they're like oh no okay but i'm doing i'm doing bjj yeah. you know what i'm saying <laughs> it's one of those i was you know uh um I was submitting blue belt today like nothing. I'm wow. I'm just a beginner, you know. Yeah. But the guy was like, you can see the other white belts were submitting him as well. <laughs> um, sorry, I just kind of went uh, went with something else. But so, in the last twenty years, is going down. What are the which are the countries which are dominating? Is it China dominating in yeah, Russia? So the, the sport is um, now very Asian dominated. Mm -hmm. Russia is the only professional team in Europe. So obviously mm. Russia maintain a very, very high standard all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have dominated um, Europe in the last uh, 20 years. Um, although there have been occasions when non-Russian athletes have beaten Russia mm -hmm. um, 
in Europe and in the World Championships. Um, but generally, the sport is very, very Asian dominated, with China being at the top, Indonesia being a close second. Oh, Indonesia, uh, really? So, I Indonesia, I would say, are the best wushu team outside of China in the world. Um, their athletes oh. are very, very well trained, high technical skill, high physical ability. Um, a friend of mine, Edgar, he is uh, currently world wushu champion. Um, shout out to Edgar. Shout out to Edgar. <laughs> um, and he, yeah, he consistently performs very, very well at the World Championships. Um, he's uh, currently Indonesia's top athlete. How do you spell his name? Um, e D G A R A R um, Marvello, so space M A R V. Oh, sorry, M A R V E double L O. There you go, Edgar Marvello Wushu. So this this chap is very very I've, I've watched him since he was a junior because i've been around for centuries uh, and now he's a senior and he is definitely the best wushu athlete at the moment outside of china you never think of that indonesia they were uh, strong in, in wushu you never really see that mm. and i just lived in indonesia for seven months yeah maybe in bali that's not the place where they hang out <laughs> no the the national team trains in jakarta um yeah. But, I mean, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was Malaysia. Malaysia was the top team. And right. then it was Korea. And then it was Vietnam. Um, and Japan have had their, their time as well. Now, it's Indonesia. Right. How old is this video? Uh, this is the 2019 World Championships in Shanghai. Were you there? I was there, yeah. You were there. Jesus Christ, look at that speed. So, Edgar is quite well known for doing his double twisting moves. So this is a jumping outside kick, 720, absolutely nailed. And then he sets up for his second one, a jumping inside 720. You should work as a commentator for Wushu competitions. Look at you. <laughs> um, and right he, now, he's attempting this one. This. <laughs> but he, he hits absolutely everything spot on, and he nails his routines. But you'll notice that the um, format of his routine and everybody else's is all about the big jumps first. It's mm. just jump, 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 jump. And then there's, then comes a bit of wushu to finish off the uh, the routine. Whereas if you go back into the 80s and 90s... They would start with the big moves it, first. Well, in the 80s and 90s, it was massively full of wushu techniques. Uh, different punches, different kicks, combinations, styles, all sorts. Whereas right, tiger now, style and all uh, that well, stuff. It was, it was full of flavor, full of wushu mm. style and flavor. Now the competition... When you do the routine to score the highest mark, you have to hit all the big jumps, get them done and out of the way, mm -hmm. and then you do all the technical moves like this, and then you just fill out the routine with the most simple things that you can do to maximize your top score. Really? You do not want to be filling the routine with really, really nice, flashy movements, because you'll be out of energy and you'll make a mistake and then it's game over. Mm. So the routines nowadays are very simple, but all about the jumps and the acrobatics and balance. So, if you looked at a, uh, say, a 1980s wushu routine, it would be very different from this. Yeah. Very different. Um, but that's, still of a high that's standard. That's interesting. And what do you think What are the reasons why it has it changed like that? Uh, well, th these routines are designed to meet the competition requirements. You have to score a minimum of 2.0 in the jumps, in what we call nandu, the difficulty moves, and you have to try and hit a 5.0 in technical requirements any mistake you make is comes off that 5.0 so mm. the majority of marks is about not making mistakes only the smallest mark is about um your performance so we lose the essence of wushu nowadays so what why do you think that happened um because the international wushu federation are trying to make it a more clear-cut um style right so imagine a gymnastics floor routine it's full of technicality. You get marks for the difficult moves that you do. And the more difficult they are, the higher the score. Mm -hmm. um, the less mistakes you make, like stepping and all that kind of stuff, the higher your score. But the smallest part of the score is actually how stylized your routine is. That's just icing on the cake. And that is now how wushu routines are. Whereas mm. in the 80s and the 90s, it was actually all about the style of the routine and the, the basic movements and how much you can feel. Yeah, out the but routine. why do you think that happened? 
Um, because of the Olympics, the, the, the IWF are trying to get wushu oh, into the Olympics. Oh, so, so hard. then you can standardize the also the grading and make it easier. It kind yeah. of makes in one point it makes sense. It does make sense because otherwise it's difficult to like one is going with their flavor with their flavor. But like, how do we judge them? How do we mm, score them? Exactly. So they have tried mm. to take it away from a subjective um, marking point of view and try and make it more clear cut. And it is. But what it's done in the process is ha it has really diluted the style of wushu. Mm. It's very different, you know, say 30 or 40 years ago. Some will say it's for the better, you know, because if it does go into the Olympics, you have a very clear cut um, set of rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you can understand them, because they're quite difficult. Um, but the actual style and flavor and essence of what makes wushu, wushu, has pretty much yeah, gone yeah, together. Yeah, yeah but you, you kind of understand why that happened, in yeah. a sense, you know, it would be difficult to maintain um, that. It's just, um, can you imagine if, if like, you need to score some a battle and you don't really know how do you gonna score if uh, there's a punch in the face or, or a kick in the leg or whatever, how mm. do you score? And maybe each of them would be, have different scores. So then try to simplify as much as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah competitions crazy no I, I i always looked at wushu it was like thought it was insane first time i saw wushu guys were in like gymnastics plays when they were doing their tricks and stuff and all i've done in the past was some karate so um, that is pretty cool well i think now we could talk about how the hell did you get in the film industry what happened someone saw your super cool moves and said hey um, you could do that was, on the screen. It was actually um, the first job I ever did was the Elvis Presley versus JXL music video. Oh, so, okay. Um, there was a music video that came out um, at the turn of the century by uh, a group called JXL. And they basically did a remix of Elvis Presley's A Little Less Conversation, A Little More Action. And I was in London training at the time, had no ambition to work in the film industry at all. How long ago was that? Uh, 22 years ago. Oh, jeez. Um, so old. I was, uh, yeah, man, I was like 19 uh, or 18 <laughs> or something. I can't remember. Um, and I'm saying you're old. I'm only three years yeah, younger you're than you. That much, you're not that much younger. <laughs> Stop pretending. Um, and my friends who I was training with at the time were going to this audition. And I, they said, oh, do you want to come along? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll come along. Um, not really knowing what I was going for, I just knew that they were doing an audition for something. Um, I'd already done a couple of um, like live performances with my with the team, um, but certainly nothing in front of the camera. Because Bush is notorious for doing a lot of uh, performances. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I know Kung Fu. Mm. Uh, you probably know um, Yusuf Chandri. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so he's one of the stunt guys, and we got on register six years ago together. And whenever he wouldn't do stunts, he would be doing some performances. Yeah. So they do all the um, performance with the... Um, the line dance. The line dance yeah. and that stuff. Does Wushu have as well, line dance? Uh, well, line, line dance is actually more traditional Kung Fu. Oh, okay. Um, and some Wushu practitioners that do traditional Kung Fu have also done line dance as well. Mm. Um, so there again, there are tie-ins, there are connections with that. Generally though, most mainstream Wushu guys just do wushu mm. do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so um but yeah i went to this audition um had no idea what the audition was for just went into the room signed my name on that bit of paper um and jumped around and just did some stuff um you did not turn your phone off i put it on silent oh my god <laughs> it's a london number so it must be important <laughs> um <laughs> he so just lost the big job <laughs> that's it yeah yeah we were gonna hire you but you ignored us so <laughs> Um, and yeah, so I did this audition, um, got a phone call later that day saying, yeah, you've got the job. And I was like, what job? And they said the, the Elvis video. And I was like, oh, right. Okay, cool. Whatever that means. Um, the following week I turned up to this, um, location outside. It was just like this box. Um, and that's it. I got paid 250 quid for doing a bit of wushu in front of the camera. And I was like, wow, oh my God, money for wushu. This is good. Yeah. And then that's it. I was like, how do I do this again? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then over the time, obviously music videos, TV commercials, eye dents, live shows, Chinese acrobats, uh, short films, independent films, feature films. They just mm. grow and grow and grow and grow. And obviously the more I learned, the more I could get into other um, aspects. How much work did you lose or didn't get because you don't look Asian enough? A lot. <laughs> you would not believe the amount of Look at of this jobs. guy, blonde, looks like Daniel Craig pretty much. Like yeah. you can do Bond. Wow. 
But so, yeah, I lost a lot of. Say lost. Um, Didn't get it. <laughs> performance wise, no problem. Mm. Look wise, yeah. a big problem. Um, the amount of uh, auditions I did, and they were like, Steve, we love what you do. You're just not Asian enough. Mm. And I was like, right, okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah. And I would always then see that job, maybe a TV commercial or a bit in a film, and it would be an Asian guy doing it. Um, and I'd be like, okay, well, fair enough. That is, That has always been the stereotype, mm. and I've come to accept that. Um, and it's not often, actually, that I do wushu for film or TV because by and large they don't want to see no. you know a blonde white guy doing Chinese martial arts they want yeah. to see the Asian guy it's, the same, it, yeah. it's just the way it is unfortunately and it's, I'm, it's I'm I have welcome to, to the club with me same yeah. thing I mean I always get cast as a Russian baddie yes of course. that's pretty much it and, you, and got the perfect accent and the look and everything yeah baby yeah. and then the, the funny thing as well I did for two years I thought you know I did Kung Fu and like, all these weapons and XMA and all that stuff and then I was like, oh, but I'm never going to get hired in that, you know, area. And then that yeah. never happened. Um, but in the same time, you know, I'm so glad that I actually did tip my toe in it. It's it's so much fun. Yeah. Um, interesting stuff. And now you've been doing films and, and, and for how long? How long has it been? Um, I think the first feature film I did was 2011. Mm. Um, and then... It would come in come in waves. Sometimes there'll be a few at a time, and then it might be a year or two or three years before um, a job. But also because um, at different times I prioritise wushu competition, mm. um, I have to look like a year or so ahead and say, right, I really want to focus on that competition. And it takes the whole year to train for that competition. You have to do pre-season, um, off-season, and competition season training, um, put on weight, build up strength lose the weight to get faster and more flexible mm. so it's a, it's a big long program to get to a high standard at international competition and if i choose to do that i actually um put off doing any other type of work unless it's a very short contract because yeah, yeah. you know what it's like sometimes on movies you can be contracted for months yeah um and if you do that that is your life you don't really have time to train like a proper athlete so yeah yeah it's and especially um, on the films um you know don't get proper sleep don't get proper food and it is. Um, it can be hectic, mm, and, and mm. Um, yeah, and don't have time to train, That's which right. is one yeah. of the biggest ones. Um, and now you've been quite busy. Probably projects we're not allowed to talk about, are we? Um, not just yet. No. Probably, yeah, um, maybe uh, maybe when we get to your fiftieth po- podcast, we can uh, hey. have, have a bit more of a chat about there it. There you go. But still, you are well. We, one thing we can tell it's um, you quite involved in in coaching other people. Yeah. Um, how do you find that? Um, I actually enjoy it. It's very good. Um, I've always chosen not to be a coach although Mm. over the years I have coached at random times Um, and I've started to do a bit more coaching of actors uh, and other stunt guys um, in martial arts and wushu uh, in general Um, and it's it is very rewarding watching some of these guys going from beginner or basic level uh, and picking up these skills in a matter of weeks Mm. and then applying it in a fight choreography um, situation um, it's very, very satisfying to see them do that. Um, and How weird was it for you to go, to move from uh, doing wushu performances and stuff? Because you guys, uh, did you do any fights on the show? You would do sh- f- fights on the show, like on the stage fights, right? Yeah, but yeah. But they would be so different from the stunt fight. Uh, very different, yeah. Yeah, so, so how to li- sell li- the punches and stuff oh, like definitely, that. Oh, definitely, yeah. Live performance um, fights, choreographed fights. Um, are very theatrical yeah um, and, and also over the top they have very to be exaggerated over. because like yeah, yeah people in, a, in the row in the back they're not going to see it correct obviously. that's right and even in wushu competition you have uh, team events and the team events are where you do choreograph fights and they're, they're quite amazing to watch but they are also very theatrical they're very over the top um, if you type in the wushu dwelian which is D-U-I D-U-I L-I-A-N. There you go. Yeah. So that this is the 2015 World Championships, and this was one of the best fight routines I've ever seen. I thought it, there's going to be that that girl there's a, with the girls as well. And that then, was the same competition. Same competition yeah. where they stab and they just go under that. And this is, this is also the same routine, but with the guys. Oh, okay. So I watched this live at the World Championships, and yes, you can argue that it's is got, so fast. It looks nothing like fighting, but it's very theatrical. Yeah, but try try to just do that. Like, look at just how many moves in that one. <laughs> it's insane. Watching these guys train is twist. very very good. That's so incredible. when they do the when in the training when they do this spear action, 
they actually practice it on a uh, on a mannequin on a dummy oh, and okay. it's basically sat on the floor and they're just for ages just stabbing away at it trying to not hit it have you heard any accidents like this i've never seen any but i'm sure it probably exists quite a for lot for someone who who is just an average joe i don't know a plumber <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know why I took plumbers. Let's do the tax man comes home, has a beer, sits down on the couch, and then sees this. <laughs> would they would be, be like, "What, the, what hell? the hell is this?" <laughs> yeah, the speed and the agility to these guys is oh, yeah, kicking a butt. I like that. Bush. But yeah, this is very different from anything that you would do in a uh, in a movie. Yeah, but at the same time, to to w when you can do that, for you to adjust to do stuff in the movies, well, it takes a it, little bit. It, you you still have to train. For yeah, yeah, yeah. You fighting, do have to train, obviously, but, but you you do have the advantage. physical ability, crazy advantage. Yeah, um, timing, rhythm, yeah. choreography. Um, obviously, for movie fights, is very different. But you should, in theory, have plenty of physical ability to pull off a movie fight if you can do a uh, one minute 30 routine like that yeah that's crazy they don't even look like they broke a sweat no well in Nuts. china when you do these routines you just keep doing it and keep doing yeah, it, keep doing yeah. it it's insane the time when i did kung fu and i, I would i would i would say like well so not how difficult is to repeat the same routine over and over mm -hmm. <laughs> do it three times you're sweating through everywhere um, it's it's very physically demanding, and um, we we used to have to train our routines back to back. So my coach, um, I recall in two thousand and five, um, he had me doing my stick routine six times back to back, and That's it insane. was it was horrible. I was sick every time, like literally straight to the toilet and. Bleh. Yeah. Um, but when I got to the competition, <laughs> I was so, so fit. Like doing one routine yeah. was absolutely a piece of cake. Yeah, that's, I think what they follow is that uh, whenever, how does I, hard in training, but easy on war or yeah. whatever the saying goes. Yeah. And it makes so much sense. I remember even like for, for my uh, whatever perf uh, training and then when I performed and you're right, my coach would do the same sh Sifu. Shifu or Sifu? Uh, Sifu is Cantonese and Shifu is oh. Mandarin. Oh, wow. However, that actual title means master. All oh, right. And in Wushu, we don't have master, we have coach. Oh. In Kung Fu, you have master. Yeah, we always have master, yeah. Because Sifu. it's a martial art. But in oh. Wushu, you have a coach because Wushu is a sport. Oh, wow. I like that. That so, is really cool. Yeah. For those who don't know those kind of things. Also, do you know the translations for Kung Fu and for Wushu? Yeah, so Kung Fu basically means um, hard work or to work hard. So Kung Fu doesn't actually mean martial arts. You can have Kung Fu in Wushu. So Wushu Wait, be just give a second, that plane. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ, what is this flying there? They've come to pick you up to work on the movie. Oh yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go it again. So I heard also that Kung Fu is, uh, there's a translation for Kung Fu is something peace or... Well, um, hard training. Hard training. Hard training yeah. is Kung Fu, right? That's correct. So um, Kung Fu is hard work or hard training. Mm -hmm. And you can have Kung Fu in Wushu. So by that, what I mean is Wushu means war art, or as we know it, martial arts. Oh. That's what Wushu means. Um, and Kung Fu means to work hard. It's like hard work, hard training. So Kung Fu itself doesn't actually mean martial arts at all. Mm. You, you have Kung Fu in wushu exactly i like this yeah because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people have no idea what the difference is no you know it is a very generic term now. ignorant bastards well we, we just assume that kung fu means kung fu like martial arts mm. you know? um but the actual chinese term for martial arts is wushu mm. um, and that's very very difficult because obviously what i do which is known as modern wushu or wushu generically refers to the sport the competitive sport of mm. wushu Whereas Kung Fu technically should be known as Wushu, but we refer to Kung Fu as the traditional Chinese martial art. Jeez, Christ. Wing Chun, Hong Gar, it's not Lao Gar. Confusing all at all. Confusing. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Smack. <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. Hey, nice one. Um, then I also hear that uh, Wushu came from Kung Fu. Yes, it did. It did. It okay. did. So basically, when um, the People's Republic of China was formed, um, they wanted to make a national curriculum, a system 
of all the Chinese martial arts and develop it into a national sport. Mm. Um, so what they did was basically they had this massive, massive um, campaign where they collated all the martial arts in China um, and they basically turned it into a curriculum, into a sport which we now know as Wushu. So they could teach it in schools, give scholarships to athletes um, and basically uh, maintain the heritage and the legacy of Chinese mm. martial arts but without promoting fighting. Because the last thing China wanted was another rebellion yeah, to yeah, overthrow yeah, the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they didn't want everybody to become Chinese martial arts masters. Mm. Uh, and actually a lot of traditional Kung Fu masters in China fled China. They went to um, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, um, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc., etc. And you'll find a lot of traditional Chinese martial arts masters have gone to those countries and teach those systems there. Bec they fled because... Because you, the Chinese martial arts was banned. Traditional Chinese oh, martial arts okay. was, was banned decades ago in China. So that's why um, the Chinese government turned it into a sport, into a, into a professional performance sport. Yeah, and you hear these stories all the time, like capoeira in Brazil. They uh, pretend that it's a dance where people just socialize, but actually it's a martial art. Mm. Uh, Indonesians also are notorious for silat. Yeah. You know, they would... Um, I don't know what was the story there, but uh, it, it was... The silat is one of the most vicious ones where they use karambit, this little like uh, knife, which is like a, like a claw, and then it just open your stomach and whatever. Wow. And it's like, and the the I don't know why I'm kind of <laughs> talking about this, but that was also adjusted to like that uh, Indonesian people are usually smaller, mm. and whoever was coloni colonizing them, colonizing at the time, so they could fight them back, and they had all these ways to to rebel. But yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to see all these different martial arts developing. Um, that is our second half. And cool. we're still talking about Wushu, man. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, there was one thing I want to ask about Wushu. Uh, are there many different names and different types of Wushu? Yeah, so actually Wushu is um, a generic umbrella term. Right. Within Wushu, you have all the styles of Chinese martial arts. So you have Long Fist, which is Changchun, Southern Fist, which is Nanchun, then you've got drunken, you've got animal styles, um, you've got soft styles, you've got tumbling boxing, um, you have things like eight ancestors boxing, Wu Dang, Fanzi, Baji, Bagua. You have literally dozens Jesus and Christ. dozens. What about dozens. your? What what is the style you do? So I started out in Changchun, which is northern style, mm -hmm. uh, which is all the acrobaticy stuff. Same as Ray Park, the same as most people that do Wushu. Mm. Um, as I've got older. Um, I've moved towards Nantren, which is Southern style. I thought you were going to say went to Drunken one. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've learned a bit of Drunken, Fanzi Tren, Detang Tren. So I've covered a lot of other styles over the time that I've been training. But for mainstream training and competition, I've now started to go to uh, Southern style, which is more big stances, powerful fist striking techniques, um, and uh, less sort of jumping around and being acrobatic -y. The drunken one, probably anyone who's listening to this, they would be curious. What the hell is drunken what one? Is, how did it start? Drunken? How did it started? And uh, probably most of people know of drunken Wushu is from Jackie Chan's films. What yeah. was the film he was? Um, the it was actually called Drunken Master. So the first one he did was Drunken Master, which was uh, the one that got him famous, I believe. Um, when he transitioned from being a stuntman to an actor, yeah, um, and then uh, no, 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 that they get c concussed okay. and they like kind of don't understand what's going on, yeah, and then as soon as the guy comes closer, they attack, yeah, but that I think I'm not sure if that's forbidden now or whatever because that theoretically that is the same as drunken style, yeah, do you know what I mean? Because I think referee gets confused, like, are you actually hurt, you know, that's right, yeah, because it's. Because it's not obvious, you know, because if you are actually hurt, does the referee stop the fight? Yeah, or, yeah, exactly, you know I mean? exactly. Yeah. Drunken, and how long? There is a film about drunken Tai Chi. Um, drunken monkey, all of that kind of stuff is crazy. <laughs> it's like, I mean, monkey style is- Dad, I want to do martial arts. What did you choose? I will be drunken monkey. Dr drunken uh, monkey. Well, you already that. <laughs> yeah, drunken Tai Chi monkey. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That is our second segment, uh, Drunken Monkey, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Awesome choreography. So this is our third segment. I was just discussing with Steven that um, this podcast is not called anymore a collection of 
Wait. A collection of blueprints, but it's called For Nars Podcast. Because I thought it was going to be easier. Um, not that anyone cares. <laughs> let's, just, let's just be honest. <laughs> Uh, okay, we're getting our visual back. Now, I would like to talk about some um, inspirations. How mm. Steven got inspired to do what he does. And one of the reasons of him <laughs> doing what he does Absolutely. is apparently this. I am pleased to present <laughs> our Russian brother, <laughs> Eastern Europe's most feared martial <laughs> Ivan yeah, <laughs> I just man. like yeah. Van Damme is playing a Russian dude. <laughs> like, does he look Russian here at all? Not really, no. And then it's like, what does Russian look like though? Well, the thing is, Russia is so massive, you can't say yeah. that somebody looks Russian. But you would go for probably blue eyes. Yeah, it could be dark hair. I don't know. Yeah, it could. I think at the time, fine. Uh, Van Damme looks looks Russian. The thing is, he had very little dialogue, so you would never tell. Yeah, him. yeah, 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 yeah. And it's funny to, I just love to go some old choreographies, the way they fight, and it's like you, st it's obvious you don't sell that punch. It's just so obvious. Yeah. But for those days, it was totally fine. So we're talking about a film, no retreat, no surrender. Mm. So I asked Stephen, give me your three films which influenced you the most or you like them the most or whatever and this was numero uno no retreat no surrender why tell me why okay so before <laughs> i actually got into martial arts yeah um, i was hanging around with my friend uh, sean Eady, mm. and I shout out to sean Eady. Sh shout out to sean <laughs> this is all because of you um so he and his brother luke were doing karate at mm -hmm. the time and they were massively into martial arts i think their their dad was a big martial arts fan as well and I was around his house, and he had this movie on, um, and I had no idea what it was. It must have been about 1987 when we watched it, um, and I was just like, I'd never seen anybody move like that, you know, punches and kicks and all that mm. kind of stuff. And I was like, this is incredible. What is this? Bearing in mind, I was like five or six years old at the time. Yeah. And I was like, this is 1986. Um, I was two years old. Yeah. So I, I was five in 86. But you would get to UK probably in 1986. Seven, eight. Something would you like get that, that fast? Um, it would have been, yeah. It would have been about then. In yeah. Latvia, it would come in like ten years later. What, two thousand and eighteen? <laughs> no idea, man. Because the Iron Curtain and stuff, we got films way later. Way later, yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously, we watch this film now and we compare it to stuff that we've seen in the last sort of twenty, thirty years, um, and it's it's a terrible movie nowadays. Mm. But in nineteen eighty six. Oh, yeah. It was incredible. And I was blown away by the whole idea of people doing kicks and punches and being able to fight multiple opponents and all that kind of stuff. And the whole Bruce Lee thing coming back from the grave and coaching him, mm. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Mm. Um, and my mate Sean was like, oh, I do karate. And I was like, no, you do karate. And he's like, yeah. Took me upstairs, showed me his colored belts. And I was like, <gasps> oh, shit. And that's where it all began, literally in that moment. All right, so and that's that's when you got uh, went for Shotokan. And that's when I went to Shotokan, yeah. Um, and it's lit almost, I would say, at the same time, when I started going to karate, that's when my old brother said, oh, I've been doing Kung Fu for like mm. ages. Kung Fu or Wushu? Kung Fu. Kung Fu at the time, yeah, he was yeah. in Kung Fu. In Hong Kong, that's right. Mm. So, um, and that's when that all began. So this really- <gasps> I just remember, it it's Kyoko Shinkai. Oh, Kyoko Shin, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Is all it a joke? No, It's wait. not a joke, no, it's the- <laughs> so yeah we just uh, we couldn't remember what was the other karate style one was Shotokan which we were doing and the other one which was way more aggressive and they punching the stomach and kicking in the head and it's called Kyoko Shinkai yeah so there you go sorry you're going back um, yeah that's so, where yeah, you started so this is where it started this was the first movie that I ever saw with martial arts that actually um, turned me on to martial arts mm. wow like, but some of them, it's, you know, like this, for example. That's, that's actually contact. That's a proper it's contact, yeah. Like, the stunt guy really took one for the team there. Yeah. yeah. Properly connected. So yeah. that, one, that one was quite flimsy. It just goes, you know, that kick is so far away from the head. Yeah, I mean, that's typical, though, isn't it, of, um, like, the 1980s Van Damme. Yeah, and Van Damme doesn't office. hold his kicks. You know that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, no. I heard um, on Expendables. Actually, that's a very famous interview. 
Um, Expendables 2 or 3. Which one was the... Um, Scott Atkins was on. He was playing an evil Russian dude. I have no idea. Um, so there was... A, do you remember there was one... Um, Chris Hemsworth's brother. Mm. He was playing the uh, sniper... That's right. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, um, I know that Van Damme and Scott had a, uh, a a decent fight on one of them. I'm not sure if it was number two or three. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. they had the the last fight. Mm. Um, but so the, there's this thing when knife gets uh, sta- uh, gets all the way got in his chest, and Van Damme kicks it. So he puts the knife and just kicks it in. Mm. Uh, and uh, that actor, I forgot his uh, his name. Uh, Liam Hemsworth. Liam Hemsworth. Yeah. Here you go. He said that that he properly kicked him. What? <laughs> and and then said like, oh, it's nothing, because he was had a Russian accent. <laughs> Terrible. No excuse. Yeah. And like I think one of the worst ones is when they do the uh, when they do the um, what's they call the um, um, hook kick uh, hook punches, and it just goes all over like on the top. I yeah. like that. Yeah, Van Damme's <laughs> not that tall. <laughs> it's like half a meter away. That was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's yeah. that's one of the things you that I learn do. Should to do box splits, mate, because that would be really good. I do them all the time, you <laughs> asshole. But it was so hilarious when. This kid is doing that old Bruce Lee stuff there. Mm. This, yeah. and the 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 soundtrack. It's like from the Street Fighters, or sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So funny. Jason do, 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 do. Um. Anyways, yeah. So Van Damme is playing the baddie, and then there's this massive fight. Um. I wasn't very huge fan of this one. But I think the the second one, the blood sport, which you chose your second film, that yeah. was a film because you could see all sorts of styles there. That the, was insane. There was everything about this movie um, sort of captured my imagination at the time. It, it was um, because it was about full contact martial arts. There was lots of styles in it. Mm. Um, the soundtrack. Um, I mean, the music was by um, the same guy that did Top Gun. Mm. Um, Kenny Loggins. Oh, okay. So Kenny Loggins did the um, the Kumite soundtrack for this, um, and everything about it was just like it was everything a martial artist wanted to yeah, be. Yeah, do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? um, and at this time, I can't, was this 1988? Yeah. So I would have watched this in around 1990 when I was sort of heavily into karate, mm. um, and I was just like, "Wow, this is incredible!" Because it is actually even now. A pretty good movie. Mm, you know? Yeah. And I know Van Damme is usually slated for not being a great actor, but in this, I thought he was fantastic. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, it was a good story. I know that um, there's a lot of um, a lot of bad press about the reality of this story, like where it actually came from and Frank Dukes and um, how real all of that was. But if you ignore all that rubbish and just watch this movie as a movie, mm. it's... For a young kid, for a teenager, or um, somebody who's like eight or nine years old, it can be very, very inspirational. So, what what about real? How real was it? What happened? So, the, apparently, this movie is based on real events, and right. Frank Dukes is a real person. And although with all movies it is dramatized, um, this was supposed to be quite factual in everything that mm. happened. Um, and it gives you this, all that information at the end of the movie as well. But in recent times, uh, Frank Dukes has been outed, basically, by the internet. Um, apparently, it was a lot of exaggerated nonsense. Um, oh, he wasn't okay. really as good as he was. Um, and it's the, the truth of the blood sport story, Frank Dukes, is a bit of a joke, really. So mm. I'm not saying that from a um, from a factual point of view. That's just what I've seen and read on mm. some of these video YouTube videos that have basically outed Frank Dukes. Um, like right, but at the same time, does it really matter? Look it, what we got out exactly. of it. Exactly. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I don't really care about the truth of yeah. the movie and what actually happened. I mean, I'm never going to meet the guy, um, and whether it actually happened or not makes no difference to me whatsoever. What made a difference to me was this movie and how it made me feel mm. um, and what it propelled me to do. Do you know what I mean? If you notice, No no Retreat, No Surrender and Blood Sport and the next one we're going to see in a moment have one major thing in common and that's competition. Bo- box splits? <laughs> <laughs> box splits, yeah. Actually, they do, yeah. Um, but they're well, all... I mean, the, the, the evil guy here, the, the baddie is so perfect. Bolo right? Young is and it's, brilliant. And it's crazy to see him now when he's older, like the older mass is gone. He's yeah. Like, yeah, it's, he's still, it's incredible. Still kicking. 
And his son, though, has um, been bodybuilding and training martial yeah, arts. Yeah, and his son looks very similar. Very, very similar. Yeah. yeah. Blood sport. I me back in Latvia. No, no martial arts around, so I could just watch and then I go do flips in the in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> I tried doing flips without training once, and it oh, yeah, di- didn't well, end well. What was your story? Because m- me, I was, um, you know, there's this like kind of a, a little wooden construction. What do you have when you put out, like wooden bars to 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 saw them? Mm-hmm. So I used that as the uh, platform, and I stand on that and did backflip. And thank God there was like a quiet, soft soil in a, in my garden. I landed head head, yeah. head on, like I had full mouth with dirt, yeah. and I was just spitting out. And I was like, I almost broke my neck. Yeah. And I said, okay, I probably shouldn't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, I did pretty much the same thing because uh, my dad's a fisherman, so mm. basically I would put his fishing box um, out on the garden, and I would find the softest bit of grass. It was all the same. It was all like hard soil, <laughs> and I would stand there, and I would be like, okay, so all I need to do is jump and tuck my head in and i tried it so many times and i just basically spanked on the floor landed on my head you know running around the garden going oh it hurts i'm dying i'm dying help me somebody i broke my neck um and i would just keep doing it and i i never got it i never got it and i was like (laughs) for for ages i was trying to learn how to flip how to um aerial cartwheel and I had no idea what I was yeah. doing, but all I was doing was just hurting myself every time. <laughs> I was like, "That's not how to." Because at the time where you lived, uh, did you hear anything about gymnastics and that the thing existed? No, no there was because no where I grew up, we just didn't have any of no, that. I mean, there there were there were kids gymnastics clubs, but I didn't know that that existed at mm. the time. And you would think, why gymnastics? I need martial arts because exactly. you would think that martial arts doing all the cool tricks. That's what I thought. Yeah, which they don't. <laughs> Well, they do now. <laughs> and now we have best of the best. I like how you had also by years, like from 86, 88, 89. What it, I think what it um, represents is where I was going in my journey of martial arts. So this now is um, a more serious film, a lot better actors, With more Darth drama. Vader himself. Oh, brilliant. Yes. <laughs> you are not a team unless you don't give a damn about one another. <laughs> and that's that's brilliant. I mean, this for me... Um, epitomizes what um, I have become over the years. A competition athlete in martial arts or wushu now, obviously uh, having progressed from karate, um, and being a team player in martial arts, in competition. Mm -hmm. Um, Being part of a team, representing the country, going to Asia against the odds um, and winning competitions. This really is what set me up for who I am today. What are your main odds? Is that the old age? Now, yeah. Do you know what? Nowadays, um, the main the main odds um, against me is old age and not getting injured. Mm. Because obviously, if I get injured now, the recovery time is so much longer than it used to be. Uh, but yeah, this the music to this, um, the training. Story, it's interesting that you're mentioning brilliant. music already like a couple of times. So, All the time. So for you, it's a huge kind of aspect. Massive. Music for me, ever since I was young, um, has been a massive influencer on my mood, mm. uh, on my motivation. Um, and it's something that I use regularly, even now, to help emphasize a particular um, mood or state mm. of mind that I want to be in. Yeah. Um, I've found over the years that my bi- the biggest influence on how I feel is music. Oh, so wow. um, I've come to l- come to learn to use that as an asset. Yeah. You know, um, if I want to feel a certain way or get in a certain state of mind, I select very particular types of music to listen to over a duration to get me in the right frame of mind. Um, and because my I travel a lot for training, mm. it takes me an hour and a half to get to training for wushu every Saturday. Um, and I listen to very specific music on the way there, but also very different music on the way back as a form of, I don't, I don't want to say meditation because you shouldn't be meditating when you're driving, but it's like, it helps me get in a reflective <laughs> it's drink state. drinking drive, is it not allowed? Meditating and drive is fine. <laughs> That's right. What, what were you doing to make um, you go? Yeah, I was, I was meditating. Sorry. <laughs> Why are your legs in lotus position? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm using the force oh, behi- to actually do the Behind pedals. your head. There's the different kind of force I have between my legs. Hey. Ooh. Wait. <laughs> are we getting better with this? Um, so yeah, so and I think the music aspect comes from the movies that I watched in the eighties growing up. Because obviously, as a kid, you're very impressionable mm. at that age. You must be quite a big fan of Tarantino's stuff, then. Yeah, 
Yeah. Because, like, Pulp Fiction was one of the films where the music tracks, and for him, also Reservoir Dog was all about the track. He would mm. literally spend, like, the half a budget or whatever, even more, yeah. just to get the right tracks. I would say that one of my biggest favorite things is movie soundtracks from the 80s mm-hmm. and some from the 90s but most definitely the 80s what examples give me um superman okay superman indiana jones star wars batman star trek martial arts films like best of the best blood sport kickboxer um all of those sort of things mm. so when soundtracks were actually orchestral- what about the rocky uh rocky of course yeah, yeah. rocky um Anything like that, you know what I mean? Those sort of things. Even the original Terminator film as well. Oh, ter- ter- um, ter- 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 exactly. It's insane. just, I think the, the soundtracks in the 80s, because they were still orchestral, um, they weren't pop music. Mm. It was more about music. You and you need to check out the, um, on Netflix, there's um, uh, documentaries about uh, movies that made us. Yep, I've just finished watching them. All. Oh my god, so good, right? So good. So good. Like, um, I think one of the best ones regarding soundtracks was the Home Alone. Yes, where they got this really good guy, and he, you know, got that song, that track, and and that track literally makes that film. I yep. mean, the film in general. And then I love to see the background stories, like oh, how they brilliant. struggle with all the certain stuff. Yeah, like um, the Dirty Dancing. That was incredible. I never knew any of that backstory. Yeah, yeah. And you think the the short amount of time they had to film it, um, the the low budget that they had to film Patrick it. Patrick Swayze and yeah. uh, the girl who was playing uh, what's her um, baby baby. Yeah. She they didn't like each other, and then yeah. they had to like uh, bl- get rid of that beef. Um, and and Patrick Swayze had that massive knee injury yeah. all the way through. And filming. he was jumping off the stage many yeah. times. Oh my god, but, uh, we are uh, what, what's it called the uh, when you talk about the film and you are. Giving too much information. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah, but... Yeah. So uh, none of that actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. There you go. There you go. Um, okay, so this is the films right now. I also asked you about the books. Mm. So this is the cool thing. But, uh, oh, look at this. Look at this. Renard's podcast. How beautiful is that? Oh. And you look on the open space and you have all these guys here you talk to, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So artistic. And here's some of the titles we have. How do you pronounce that? That is the Tao of Jeet Kune Do by Bruce Lee. Yeah, so I started reading it. I wasn't to- totally full of shit. I started reading it. <laughs> and uh, one of the things what I straight away noticed, well, it's it's quite a difficult read because it's not a storyline. It's at least in the first 20%. That's how far, far I got. Yeah. But it was all these quotes and he's taking from these... Um, um, uh, Tao, was it, who was it from? It was from um, these... It, but it's basic. a lot of it is from um, Confucianism and Taoism. Confucianism, here you go, yeah. Um, so Bruce Lee was a massive philosopher, mm. um, as well as being... A lot of people artist. don't know that about a him. A lot of people it's don't It's insane. I would, I would go as far to say he was as much into philosophy as he was into martial arts, mm. and it massively influenced who he was and um, how his martial arts developed. So the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, although Jeet Kune Do is his martial art that he devised, um, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, it contains so much philosophy. It it shows you so much about how Jeet Kune Do was developed, where it sort of um, started in his mind from a philo- philosophical sense. Yeah, I'm trying to open my Kindle for some reason I can't because I actually I took out some of the quotes he used. Mm. But like what I remember from in the basics, he was so against the system. Yes, very. He was much so. really against the system, and one uh, one of the ways he was showing uh, that. Anyone who is doing martial art, whether it's traditional uh, judo, karate, whatever, they are following the, these basic rules where we've been around for three, th- 4,000 years. Mm. And he was all about, let's be different, let's be fluid, yeah. let's do. And that's what Jeet Kune Do was standing for. Correct. So it's, it's it actually follows the principle of Taoism, um, that you everything has to be sort of in the present, simplified, um, organic, um, flexible, um malleable you know the whole idea of pouring water into yeah. a cup you become the shape of the cup the water yeah. becomes the shape of the cup you pour be the water be the water so mm. um from a philosophical point of view um in life you don't want to be rigid because mm. in life and in in nature things change they evolve they're good they're bad they're hot they're cold um they're easy they're hard 
that life in general never stays static. You cannot depend on anything to stay the same all the time. You know, night turns into day, turns into night, and we've got seasons and all that kind of stuff. So Is that the original? Uh, that's the original cover, yeah. yeah. It's the same one that I've got. So... Um, the philosophical side of it is to be flexible, to be one with nature and move with everything that mm. moves because nature always moves. Mm -hmm. in, and in doing so, you will have a peaceful and enjoyable life. That's how the philosophy goes. Yeah. So he applied the principle to martial arts. All martial arts are rigid systems of systematic moves that follow a set pattern that never changes. Mm. In theory, it works, but in a real fighting situation... Oh, no. It doesn't, because a fighting situation has an unlimited number of variables. You've only got to watch UFC and MMA and you know even street fights that you can now watch on YouTube. No fight, no single fight is the same. So, if you would be still alive when MMA or UFC would come be out, would you say? Would you think you would be like, oh yeah, I, I recognize this. This is cool. Probably, probably, because I mean, MMA does consist from so many different martial arts. There's gra does, grappling, yeah. striking, all of that. I mean, I, you could probably say that um, modern day UFC, MMA, um, ha it takes a lot of the ideas of, of Jeet Kune Do, whereby you know you can't always be so rigid about this fight works, this technique works. You can mm. have an idea of techniques and templates and drills and stuff that work, but you've got to be flexible enough to be able to absorb anything that comes your way mm. in any direction, in any manner. Um, if you're fixed in a particular pattern of movement, no, I can only block in this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I think you're the typical, come typical example is karate. Yeah. When we start doing sh Shotokan and uh, when you do the katas or the forms and you block like this, you block like that. It's like, it ne it, even then I was like, it never going to happen like that. And then as soon as we did actual kumite, actual fighting, then you realize that you, all we do, we just push with our hands yeah. off or we get, get out of the way. You know, that's more advanced. Yeah. And actually... Uh, um, yeah, this is something else I want to talk to you about is the uh, this karate thing, what I just found, karate combat, mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, as I uh, told you, this Latvian guy, this is this guy, his nickname is the, uh, the Bear Slayer, because in Latvia we have this... Um, yeah, so he's fighting a Brazilian guy. So Latvian dude is in the, this golden golden uh, uh, belt. So whoever is the champion wears the golden belt. Okay. And he's been champion for like five, six fights, whatever. So when you look at them, how much do you see traditional karate? Nothing. It's pretty much not Nothing. existing. I don't. I don't really get it. Like especially no. the Latvian dude, the bald guy. So he is like, it's such a boxing technique, and then he throws kicks, and it's a kickboxing. It is essentially kickboxing, yeah. You know what I mean? Because the, at the end of the day, the goal is to um, knock the guy out, to score points by making um, hits. So you want to be doing that in the most efficient um, and destructive way possible. And unfortunately, a lot of traditional martial arts don't facilitate that. Yeah, yeah, Where, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's why Jeet Kune Do came about, yeah. to achieve the end result in the quickest, in most yeah, efficient yeah. possible manner. One of, the, one of the things I remember he was talking about, the punch, uh, like when you stand here, if, the, if your hand is here, mm. why would you go as karate would go? Like they preload it and then yeah. go with a full stop. You go straight away, you punch. Yeah. And that's what he was showing. That's what he had, the famous finger punches and, punch all, and, yeah, all, and that, all that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, um, and and that's, that's really the thing. You know, he was, um, he was very much against systematic type martial arts even even the martial arts he came from which were Wing Chun mm. um, and traditional Kung Fu he, there were so many things wrong with it that he that's how he developed Jeet Kune Do but for me um, Jeet Kune, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do was less about the martial art and more about the philosophy philosophy I, yeah I didn't know I it thought was it was about martial arts so yeah. um, not long after Best of the Best I watched another film called uh, Dragon the Bruce yeah. Lee story yeah. starring Jason Scott Lee which is a super Scott famous Lee. film and that made me think twice about karate mm. because it sort of it dramatised it but it it told me the story of Bruce Lee in a, in a certain um, manner and I went and bought this book from um, W.H. Smith's at the time and I started reading it and at the time I didn't really comprehend a lot of it because I was still quite young oh yeah and it's very in but what it really made me think was, okay, I don't want to do karate anymore. Not because mm. I don't like it, but because I feel that I need to progress into something mm. different, into something that will open my mind a bit more. And it's because of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do that I actually finished doing karate and then went into Kung Fu. Um, and obviously then into Wushu. 
But this had a massive, massive impact on me because I read this all throughout my teenage years over and over and over again. Um, learning more, not just from a, a fighting aspect, but from a philosophical aspect, teaching me to be um, organic and flexible and open minded with things, you know. Um, I it, think like the expression go with the flow is perfect. Go with the flow is it's perfect. perfect for this, this yeah. kind of book. And yeah, I would not. Uh, thanks. You see, like, this is what I do. I, I enjoy to have my guests now in the future. And I always ask three best films, three best books. Because mm. if I haven't seen them, haven't read them, I would, you know, go into it. So the other two books you chose, uh, this one we had. I'm just going to do the Google thing. Um, I actually, I, I listened it um, by Napoleon Hill. So Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. Uh, is this the original one? Not sure. And um, I actually read it before a while ago, mm. and uh, and I was like, "Cool, oh, it's nice to to recap it." And um, so the, my my favorite points or the the best points, which I noticed, and kind of because also I was doing audio, so I probably would do some training, whatever. It's difficult to you know mm. get the essence, mm. but. What I got from it is just persistence, the persistence of what you believe and just never give up. And then and then it's just obviously there's it's it's a whole book about it. But in general, that's a rule for anything. Correct. Anything you do in your life, even if you, you know, you could be the worst, but you just continue persisting, persisting. Eventually, you're going to prevail. Absolutely. So. Um, think and grow rich, despite the title, the title was really um, given to the book so that it would sell because obviously everybody wants to, Want to be rich. rich yeah but the um principles and philosophy behind this book different is, kind of rich it's the essential it's the original how to be successful book yeah that's what it is and it teaches you principles and philosophy of how to be successful in anything like literally anything yeah. including how to get rich well like yeah. wealthy um if you apply the principles to that um, it was my coach that put me onto this book. So I'd never heard of Napoleon Hill or this book before that. So this was something I read as an adult. And I've probably had to read it maybe six or seven times to grasp 99% mm. of it. And I would say that as an adult, this has had the biggest influence on whether I've achieved something or not and the things that I have um, been successful in. Also against the odds, mm. like winning the European Championships twice in my mid-30s that's ridiculous yeah well obviously um, straight away you're the only one yeah you so know that that shows already that someone who can achieve um, that that's insane. i mean the, the second time i beat russia in russia at the european championships and that's that's unheard of that is a combination of um the excellence of skill of my coach first and foremost mm. but also the uh, principles that i put into practice from this book and even now, even today, I still use a lot of what I've learned from this philosophy in when I want to achieve something because it all starts with a state of mind. And do you know what was really incredible? There's a lot of quotes in this book which are in Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which wow. blew my mind because Bruce Lee read this book back in the 1960s. So this book is older than Bruce Lee's book. You would think that yes. everything is... Okay. This, this was developed decades and decades mm. ago. Um, so yeah, from a... Um, if I could give one book to anybody that wants to be successful in life, it would be this book, mm. um, simply because it will really, really help anybody to move towards a goal that might seem impossible mm. or unrealistic and actually achieve it and beyond. Mm. And sure. like when you just said about against the odds, I think the best uh, example from this book was that uh, black girl little black girl who was who went uh, to this white guy mm -hmm. and asked for uh was it like a little bit of money like 25 or 50 cent and he said like you should leave now why, why are you here but all she did she persistently stand there stare at the guy and said give me that money yeah and and she shouted or whatever and the guy was like okay i'll give it and then when she left he couldn't realize he couldn't understand how did that just happen mm -hmm. and then they were going to like being persistent know what you want to do and kind of keep on pushing on it that's right i mean there are there are a lot of a, a lot of cool stories there of um different facets about how to uh, incorporate these principles but persistence is definitely one of the cornerstones mm. because obviously you only fail when you stop trying mm. You don't fail whilst you're trying because you're still in the process of achieving. 
you only fail when you say that's it i've had enough i'm gonna stop trying but failure in itself is just a means to achieving because when you fail you know how not to do it next time yeah yeah yeah, but unfortunately with all things in life you have to fail before you succeed it's very rare you can just get onto something and go straight to success very very rare that's luck Mm. that's not achievement that's luck Mm. normally you have to go right i failed i know that i don't do it that way or i don't do it this way and the more you fail the closer you're getting to success and it's whether or not you decide that I've had enough failures, I'm going to stop. I think the biggest problem is that we, from an early age, we're conditioned that failing is bad. Yes. That is the biggest problem. That's the biggest problem. You know, it's like, um, I could hear I could hear that and feel that from my uh, teachers in school, in high mm. school, you know, even in university. The same thing would be for my parents. And then it would just think that, oh, you're going to, you know, try this and you're going to fail. What are you going to do then? Yeah. And what and that none promotes... Of, and none of them would say like, uh, well, yeah, you just try it again. <laughs> Correct. And what that promotes is the fear of failure. Yeah. And when you have the fear of failure, especially as a child, you then have the fear of starting anything in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. when something seems unrealistic. Mm. For example, you're too old to do wushu. Yeah. We'll see about that. Yeah, you're I'm, never going to work in the film industry. Oh, really? We'll see about that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it's things like that. And and I think, especially for people who come from a um, a much lesser background, mm. you know. Um, so, I mean, I, I grew up on a, on a council estate. Um, I didn't have wealthy parents or anything like that. Um, my parents split up when I was very young and my dad struggled very hard to work two jobs to raise me and my brother. It was like very difficult for him. We didn't have a lot of money. So I didn't have, you know, all the, uh, the brand clothes and trainers like sneakers and bags and all that kind of stuff so in that respect i wasn't with the crowd with the mm. guys like with the cool uh, kids i definitely kids wasn't because i didn't have all the kit that everybody else had where are you the backstreet boy yeah i was definitely i was definitely on the back street that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> um so it was for me it was always against the odds anything that i wanted to do um was always not in my favor i didn't have natural talent i didn't have money i didn't have opportunity um but what i had was perseverance Mm. and i just persisted and persisted and persisted um and that really is such a massive fundamental part of of being successful in anything is you just keep going just keep going i'm gonna restart my camera quickly it's good that we have two cameras Mm. I just didn't want to interrupt you because that was <laughs> such a bomb. It was so awesome. Um, yeah, hundred percent. And uh, and uh, I can say the same thing about anything I've done in my life. I think one of the best examples was recently. Well, recently six, seven years ago, when I was training for British Stand Register. Mm. One of the disciplines I chose was swimming. Yeah. And I chose swimming because I couldn't afford uh, Raleigh driving, couldn't afford horse riding and scuba diving. They were way more expensive. And uh, I remember when I got in the swimming pool, I was so, so shit. And I was, I looked, like, the times I did, there's no way I can pass. There's, I yeah. could, I honestly said, like, there's no way. But some little slither of uh, immigrant mentality said, no, just try, just try, just try. And I just went for it, went for it. And then three months later, like, during that time, I met this guy uh, who became my coach. And three months later, I could, you know, beat the times. And then when I passed the test, I said, there's nothing I cannot do. Starting this podcast as well, same thing. It's like, yeah, but what are we going to be talking about? What is going to happen? How are we going to do it? Now, 20, literally, this is the 20th episode later. I'm like, I kind of start understanding what's going on. I, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and like, y- y- I'm here in the shed sitting and, and we having pretty cool setup and things are happening. Um, so, yeah, th- from my perspective, the same, I would just say, just do it. Just freaking, like Shia LaBeouf was screaming his ass off. Do it. Just do it. But that's the thing as well with success. Um, When you achieve some success, you become confident that you can achieve another success. And it's usually that first breakthrough. Once you've made that first um, crazy achievement, it doesn't have to be a massive achievement. Oh, yeah, any any little bit is achievement. It just has to be something that you didn't think you could do in the first place, but you set out to do it and buy by hook or by crook, as my coach would say, you get there, you manage to achieve it. And the confidence that you get from doing that propels you onto the next thing. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, I can do this. I can do it. Um, and that that is true of anybody. You just have to do it in the first place. Mm. And I think the, the one of don't be afraid to, uh, um, you know, to fail, yeah. martial arts really help you with that. Because especially so. right now doing BJJ, 
you can be even good level belt you can still gonna get submit you're still gonna and just to have that um humbleness and and put that ego outside when you step in the gym mm, it's mm. incredible psychological yeah. game and and um the um it's, it's like right now we have one of the guys but white belt just started and you can just see that he just so wants to win you that doesn't matter because he needs to prove that he's better Damn. and i can't wait to see that <laughs> moment where he's going to realize actually this is not the reason why we're here yeah you know we're here to learn and to get better and you know you see that a lot in the in the stunt industry um you get guys come in who might be top level martial artists mm. and they've you know big fish in, mm. in their field for a long time um, but they can't do fight choreography. They've never done stunt work, but they think they're really good at what they do. And then when the stunt coordinator or the fight choreographer then starts doing the choreography, and they're like, really, you are not good at this. You have to literally start again. Um, it's a hard thing for that person to Hard take. pill to swallow, yeah. Uh, and f and the, the same was for me. Um, when I first met Ruda, um, and anybody in the stunt industry knows. Shout out to Ruda. Shout out to Ruda. What's up? Um, anybody in the stunt industry will know who Ruda is. Um, one of the best fight choreographers, um, fight directors in the industry. I think your um, nose is a little bit of brown there. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was actually Ruda that, that um, was like, Steve, you know, you've been, you know, this top guy in Wushu for a long time. Mm. But in the film industry, that doesn't count for shit. Um, so, you know, don't don't bring an ego into this at all. Mm. Be a beginner and learn from scratch. And I mm. did. I listened to what he said and I was like, right, um, forget anything that I've done, all of that kind of stuff. I need to learn from scratch. I need mm. to learn rhythm, timing, um, spacing, different styles. Because I, I would very rarely ever do Wushu for a movie. So I've got to learn so much stuff. Mm. Um, and I've got Ruda to thank for that because if I hadn't, if he hadn't have told me that and taught me that, um, I could well be walking into film jobs thinking I am the big I am. Yeah. Um, and not getting work ever again because the coordinator is like, you're a knob, get out. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I, I owe a lot to uh, to Ruda for that. We f I found him. No posts yet. No, he, Ruda he doesn't. He Ruda doesn't, no doesn't like to um, to post anything on social media. Yeah. <laughs> um, we got him yeah. but um, uh, yeah he's um, all, all the people that follow him have basically worked with him over the years and they they know how much of a good guy he is yeah and Rudy anyone who is, wants to look him up probably just look up the uh, TV series Into the Badlands exactly he yeah. was um, one of the main uh, fight coordinators and stunt, mm. stunt coordinators mm. there okay going back to our books our third book is Anthony Robbins Awaken the Giant Within I read it a while ago mm. uh, and you know Anthony's stuff is usually you know yeah. gold um, yeah, I mean, but this one is super famous and funny enough you see when I looked at him in Google right next to it was the sound habits of highly effective people that's one that's my book that's yeah. my numero uno book which I definitely suggest um, yeah so tell me about so this this came between the time of Tao, Tao of Jeet Kune Do and um, Think and Grow Rich so I um, came across this book in my late teens early 20s um, and it was a friend of mine, Gerald. Um, we used to train together in London and we worked together on the Chinese acrobats. Mm -hmm. And he had this book, the original one I think was in green. Um, and he let me borrow it for an indefinite amount of time. I think I ended up borrowing it for about 10 years oh, wow. <laughs> before I finally gave it back. Um, and I'd never read anything quite like it. Um, so uh, when I started reading it and learning about um, how to it's, it's more than a it's more than a positive thinking book it's um, it is the um, it helps you to focus your mind on what you want to achieve um, and how to make them reality how to manifest yeah um, the dreams that you have inside into reality how to thoughts make into things yes how that. thoughts can become things yeah um, and this was my first introduction really to that sort of uh, self-awakening mm. understanding what's going on up here type thing yeah because because so, anthony's childhood was rough as fuck yes like the stuff what he he went through and mm. i think that that was the mention in that book I, I, it's been a long time since i read it i don't really listen to um Anthony Robbins or Tony Robbins as he's now known I don't really listen too much to his, his recent stuff mm. um, 
and um, no uh, no offense to him but I feel like his modern stuff is very very much geared towards marketing mm. and the masses and that kind of thing because he's a massive deal yeah um, for some people it hugely helps them and that's great what I've done is this is the only book of his that I've read but it did lead me on to another chap his mentor his mentor is uh, Jim Rohn and Jim Rohn died a few years ago um, but Anthony Robbins became who he was because of Jim Rohn Mm. And for those who are interested, if you want to see where Tony Robbins came from and how he became who he is, watch Jim Rohn videos. They're all over YouTube. And Jim Rohn, his philosophy originally came from Napoleon Hill. It came from um, mm. Earl Schof first, and that came from Napoleon Hill. So all of these things all stem from the, the root, which is Napoleon Hill. And Jim Rohn has got some fantastic videos, um, speeches and seminars. And it just, it teaches you um, all the stuff, basically. Uh, R-O-H-N, that's it. Um, and I still listen to his videos now, Jim Rohn. Um, it, it takes you to where uh, Tony Robbins would have learned all of his original stuff. Mm. Basically, Jim Rohn was Tony Robbins' mentor. Um, and he, Jim Rohn, for me, even now still echoes a lot of really important details about achievement, success, uh, and all of those kind of things. So, um, yeah, you obviously you're, gonna, you're getting a vibe from these books that I read that I too have become sort of very philosophical. Not in a preachy way. I don't go around telling people, you've got to live like this and, you know, try and live like that. It's very, very personal for me, and I apply it to myself. Mm. If people ask me my opinion um, or how did you achieve this or whatever, then I will I'll, I'll explain all of this. But generally, I don't go around trying to preach yeah, philosophy. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a, a preacher in that sense. I just use it f to help myself get better at what I do. Yeah, and if people ask for advice, it's like you always can share with that. That's, that's the difference. Yeah. And I think uh, self-development books... Um, that is something what, especially where I'm from, it, it used to be such a kind of magic. No one knew about it or no one would talk about it. Mm. And my first book was uh, definitely um, um, Paulo Coelho, um, Alchemist. Alchemist, yeah. that was the one where I'm like, oh, wow, this is how. And then I got more into these books and there was a point where I read like, I don't know, 30, 40 of them. Mm. And then a lot of cell development books, it, they are, they have, the essence is very similar. Yeah. You know, and that way, that's why probably whoever, uh, you know, wrote their books, they would read Napoleon Hill and they would get inspired by that and you can see those guidelines. Yeah. And then you can still there's always going to be a little bit what they um, add from their own. Absolutely. Like, yeah. like for example, Atomic Atomic Habits, also mm, one of the mm. you know great great books, and uh, it's the values are pretty much all the same. But all he the 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 um, writer was emphasizing is that even little little shift in your everyday routine can mm. make a huge difference. Definitely. And I think that as a great analogy was when you say about two planes take off in the same uh, the same spot and then even if it's the difference is by one degree yep. then after a uh, thousand miles they're going to end they're up totally different totally places. different place yeah. so that analogy makes so much sense to me listen we talked about some cool wisdom stuff here i think we need to uh, end on something more uh fun fun stuff i know this girl actually jd yeah yeah, I yeah know a good her. friend of mine um, that was actually a, a wire work course we did with Independent Drama. Yeah. Um, That's how I met her, through Independent Drama. She came on Scott Atkins. Uh, oh, no. She came on uh, Lucha Libre um, uh, seminar or something. Okay. And then she was there. And she was my grappling partner. Mm, she's very good. She's very talented. A good actress. Um, and she uh, she really knows her stuff. Is there anything else you want to want to mention? So we talked Bushu, discussed Kung Fu, martial arts. Uh, we got a little bit into film industry, um, uh, fencing, which is your main thing. The reason why you're on this planet is to create <laughs> good fence. <laughs> um, and I mean, honestly, like when I met you first time, I thought, yeah, genuinely, you're a really nice guy. Well, that's really you know, good of you to now say is so. my brown nose. <laughs> Hopefully, I can get something out of it. But I don't really care about those things. But yeah, uh, meeting you on that uh, on that job we did together, 
it was it was pretty cool. It was a, that was a good job. Yeah, obviously we've got Daniel, Dan Styles, and Nathaniel to thank for that. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Um, uh, really shout cool. out to them. They're probably never going to watch this. But no. Well, <laughs> oh, they will because I'll send it to them. Hey. <laughs> They'll be like, "What? We had to wait right to the end <laughs> to get a shout out." Um, and um, and it's it is interesting in this industry we meet so many cool people humble people we see mm. sometimes we do see assholes but it's not very often thank thank goodness it's not very often because um i think for the likes of you and i we wouldn't want to be in the industry at all but it is part and parcel sometimes you mm. know in any walk of life um you do get the the bad apples um in the basket so to speak but fortunately the majority of people are team players you know, we all want we all want to achieve the same thing. Yeah, because otherwise so, you wouldn't be able to stick around. No, no, that's, no. That's how it works. Yeah, you know, be be good, be nice, work hard, keep your head down, um, and you'll get on fine. Basically, yeah. Don't be a dick. As, Don't be a dick. Exactly. As, it's um, uh, Anthony Robbins said that in his opening for the. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, that would be a great opening for a book. Don't be a dick. <laughs> good simple life quote. <laughs> Yeah. What could you suggest to some some of the peeps, some of the peeps who um, probably want to get in wushu or um, want to get in film industry? Well, we kind of talked about these values pretty much. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure you're going to repeat yourself, but so maybe with, there's something let's, else. Um, let's say with wushu, because um, obviously wushu is quite a sought after discipline um, in the UK and around Europe. Um, there's still quite a lot of places in the US that people can find a, a wushu school, which is great. Um, the UK and Europe is very difficult to find not only a good wushu school, but any wushu mm. school. Um, at the moment, I think there's maybe just a small handful in England. I think there's one in Liverpool, Manchester, uh, and a couple in London. Um, I don't know the names of them. I know that some of the coaches have stopped altogether. Um, the very first thing I would say is go on YouTube, because there are some really good tutorials out there for wushu. Um, that's your best bet to get started because then you will learn um, basics which are stances, kicks and punches and then you can progress onto the wushu flashy jump kicks and Mm. stuff Um, obviously if you want to go to a higher level with wushu you do need a coach Um, and a coach that knows what they're doing which is very difficult move to to China basically Um, or Indonesia I mean yeah I mean to be fair what you can do now if you've got the money and you've got the time and the resources um, and travel allows go to China to one of these wushu schools don't um don't go to the marketed places like the advertised places um the shaolin temple is a nice place to go to as a china experience um they don't teach you wushu in the same sense that i do it they teach a a very shaolin style wushu that's something completely different um if you want to learn like really technical sport wushu like what i do uh what jet li used to do then you want to be going to Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Guangdong, where they have proper um, foreign student training programs. Mm -mm. And you can enroll in these colleges and universities and do weeks or months or years of actual proper wushu training at a technical level. Um, That is a great way to do it if if there's literally nobody else in your locality that can teach you. Um, I do believe that Russia... Um, have or are starting foreign student training as well. I know um, there are some people in England and the United States that have been to Russia to train. Um, So that might prove um, effective if you've got the time and money to do so. Mm. Um, Other than that, get on YouTube, start watching some basic tutorials. Number one point of advice for anybody that wants to do Wushu, don't just go and learn a B-twist. Because if I find you, I will kill you. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> only because, only because, and this is just a... With uh, Anthony Robbins' book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Slap <laughs> you around you the up. head with the book. Um, <laughs> only because everybody wants to do a B-twist. That's great. But a B-twist, you ha- to have a good one, oh, you yeah. need to be able to do a good butterfly, butterfly kick. Butterfly kick. I even, even I even know that. Even you know that. Even I know that. Because if you have a bad butterfly kick or you've never learned a butterfly kick, your B-twist will always be terrible. It will always be terrible. Mm. Even if you ever manage to get it. To have a good butterfly kick, there are some very simple basics that you need to train in order to be able to do that. In order to be able to jump, in order to be able to have a straight leg, uh, in, or- in order to get the height, the shape... So you've you've got to do these these basic movements um, in order. There is a butterfly kick on there somewhere, I'm sure. I wanted to show you my butterfly yeah. kick if I can find mine somewhere. Um, so if you want a B twist, 
don't just go and learn to twist because that's going to be the worst thing you can do. Actually learn some basics first. I know it's boring, but it is essential. Yeah, well, I'm going to find my beach with somewhere. Did you like my Van Damme uh, concept? I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't play music for some reason. But yeah, me, me doing kicks under the water. I, it was just one morning I was bored. And then I start punching stuff under the water. Look at that power. I know. Making waves. Yeah. But it, actually, the, the originally, it was just a parody about the Creed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the Creed was doing the, these punches Boxing under there. And I was like, this is well. hilarious. But then I was like, what kind of music could I put? And I found the, found the uh, um, uh, Van Damme's film. And I did even like Spinning Kitten. Oh, <laughs> nice. Hilarious. Okay, you can stop now. Um, that suggestion. So, if Steven is gonna find you doing shitty um, B twist, he's gonna beat your ass. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring my B twist beater. Oh god! Yeah, which is just a which is basically a. Calm, but you're totally right. You, I, I can see that in gymnastics when I train as well. Like um, guys who, especially trickers, trickers have very, you know, not shitting on trickers fully, but a little bit. Uh, trickers <laughs> have some of the worst kicks, some of the worst uh, shapes, but because they never had the base. Well, tricking is about tricking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rather than being about um, some of the um, root places yeah, that some yeah, of yeah, their yeah. things came from. You know, obviously, tricking takes a lot from a lot of different disciplines, um, and tricking is cool for tricking purposes. Um, but yeah, they do take a lot of flack from um, karate and taekwondo and wushu for never really training the basic foundations mm. of those disciplines. Some people, some of them do, and, and you can see it in their movements. But generally, yeah, tricking is all about um, the next quad cork or whatever they're doing now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is great. If that's your bag, that's cool. Don't show me a B-twist if you can't butt fly. I swear to God. Hey, <laughs> slap you. Um, listen, this was amazing. Stephen, I can't thank you enough for being here, uh, sharing with this knowledge, uh, sp especially about Wushu, a little about films, but, and also like inspiring people to look out to the box. It's not always, you know, a lot of people think like, how do you train? How do you get to that level? It's not only just train hard, but what comes with it? There's this philosophy. And a lot of people don't understand that martial arts, though that is an art, that's not just beating someone up. That's right. You know, it's so much more in depth that, um, and yeah, listen, that's, uh, I have nothing else to add. Uh, we can find you on uh, Instagram as... Uh, Steve, Steve Wushu. Steve Wushu. On, on all the social media. I would have lost you. Somewhere, yeah, somewhere you are there. Instagram, oh. Facebook. Um, I do have a Twitter account, but I don't use it. Um, no one uses and, Twitter account. I don't even know and, how to uh, use YouTube it. YouTube as well. So everything, Steve Wushu. And uh, there, you'll learn. Yeah, I ask him a lot of questions. How to do B-Twist properly. <laughs> yep, yep. Where, where do you live so I can beat the crap out of you um, for, for being a dancer and not a fire? So, yeah, cool. It's been uh, a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. Dude, thank you for coming. You're Give me a little welcome. first. Oosh, Yay. Oosh, nice one. Thank you, everyone. Brush your teeth and be happy. I'm still playing here. There you go. Still playing. That's it. <laughs>